Welcome to everyone this evening. My name is Maureen O'Neill and I have the honor of being the MC this evening. And uh, it's lovely to see everyone together. Um, I always enjoy these Thursday nights, so I wanted to thank everyone who contributes, especially Farouz, who's with us, but hidden under the tile there that says Oakville Community. <laughs> thank you for that healing prayer um, going out to uh, everyone who needs the healing in these times. Um, so friends, my uh, my honor is to introduce um, our speaker this evening, Dr. Vickers. And uh, I think we're in for just such a treat. It's just such a, a wonderful topic that he'll present on this evening. Um, uh, we'll have some time to listen to Dr. Vickers and then have some question and answers. Um, and then at about 8.30, we'll switch modes and uh, go into uh, devotional. And um, this is a special time where together we can pray for the well-being of the world. Um, and before I say much more, I should say that um, uh, Dr. Stephen Vickers is currently at after midnight where he is right now. So we thank you very much for tuning in and, uh, and joining us Um and we were just laughing about how it's really hard to say you're double booked at midnight. So this, this time actually works out. Thank you for that sacrifice. So um, this evening, the topic is the tablets of Baha'u'llah to the kings and the rulers of the world. Uh, and he'll give us a background on that. But I'll just read a, a little um, excerpt here from the bio. So during the 1860s, Baha'u'llah, that's the founder of the Baha'i faith, was successfully, successively exiled to Baghdad, Istanbul, and Adirne before being consigned by the then Caliph of Islam to the prison city of Akka in the Ottoman Palestine with the intention that he be forgotten. While in Adirne and Akka from 1867 to 1871, Baha'u'llah wrote to the leading monarchs and presidents giving messages both specific and general, and often making remarkable prophecies that swiftly came true. This talk will give a brief account of the key recipients, some of what Baha'u'llah wrote to them, and what transpired. Very exciting. So Dr. Stephen Vickers holds an MA in International Economics and a PhD in International Fisheries Law, a qualified a qualified company secretary and a former awarding body CEO. He is one of two UK-based transnational education experts. Um, so we welcome you this evening and I can turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, this is always the embarrassing situation where you try and share something and it's never quite large enough. Um, because the thing that says um, slideshow is hidden by a black, um, there we go, there we go, there we go. Um, I, I can't touch the slideshow. Thank you. Um, for the moment, I, um, I can't press slideshow because it's under a Zoom caption. But there we are. Um, it looks good to us, Stephen. Sorry? It looks good to us. OK. Uh, the, the, this is uh, obviously a big subject. Uh, for those of you who are not, not familiar with the name Baha'u'llah, it sounds unusual, but but so would the name Christ. Uh, if, you, if it was new to you, it means glory of God. Um, a Baha'i uh, believes that God sends successive manifestations, if you wish, like perfect mirrors, neither uh, neither God incarnate nor mere ordinary men. They are mirrors that show forth the attributes of God and also teach us another lesson in the school of life. And what I'm going to focus on is some of the things about the letters he wrote from prison to various kings and rulers starting in a year which uh, has major significance in Canadian history, of course, 1867. 
Um, many of you will have seen this uh, statement from Baha'u'llah from two ranks amongst men, power has been seized, kings and ecclesiastics. I mean, it, it, these days when our politicians speak only in sound bites, it sounds a, a really good sound bite. But actually, Baha'u'llah was terribly polite to these kings. Uh, in addition, of course, he predicted that one day um, a monarch, or by which we might mean a head of state, would um, make it easier for Baha'is to practice their religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, although uh, from two ranks amongst men, power has been seized, kings and ecclesiastics, and most of the monarchs to whom he wrote um, did, in fact, see their dynasties end fairly soon afterwards. Uh, he's actually very nice about most of them when talking to them. Um, the master said to uh, George Latimer, just uh, an American uh, pilgrim, you must be very moderate. You must speak and write in such a manner as not to offend anyone. The Lord addressed Moses and Aaron saying, when you go to Pharaoh, speak in a moderate, sweet, sweet language. Uh, OK, there's two questions here. For you, this is audience participation. Uh, any idea what pharaoh that was? And the second one is: there's only been one ruling Baha'i monarch. Does anybody wish to use their electronic hand to uh, uh, edify me on either of these questions? To what pharaoh did Moses uh, and Aaron speak? And who was the world's only ruling Baha'i monarch? Oh, well, such is life. Um, we, we're actually uncertain, but we generally think it was Ramses II. And, of course, the only ruling Baha'i monarch has been um, the Maliatoa, uh, the late Maliatoa of um, Western Samoa. Maliatoa being a local name for king, of course. The Universal House of Justice, which is currently the... Um, collective leadership, like the supreme body of the, of the Baha'i faith, which is elected every five years, uh, referring to this um, episode in Baha'i history, says it is impossible to imagine how different the history of the past century and a half would have been had any of the leading arbiters of world affairs addressed by Baha'u'llah spared time for reflection on a conception of reality supported by the moral credentials of its author, moral credentials of the kind they profess to hold in the highest regard. Now, a quick aside, why, why would Baha'u'llah write to these kings? He wasn't just, um, uh, if you like, um, advertising himself. These people were in a position to move the world into unity. And he actually said a number of times that uh, once he had been rejected by most of these monarchs, that the world would be united anyway, but would be a more painful experience than it would have been had they taken counsel together and resolved to bring the world into unity quickly. Our story starts before 1867 in um, a not very salubrious uh, former water system beneath the palace of the Shah the Sia Shah, the black pit, if you like, shown here with lots of people in it. It was uh, the Shah's main dungeon. Bahá'u'lláh, of course, was a prisoner or an exile right the way from 1852, when he was uh, incarcerated in the black pit with a couple of hundred other people, until when he died in 1892, he wasn't always completely um, under in a particular building, but he was often under house arrest. From the Black Pit, pit every day, some of his fellow inmates and co-believers were hauled off to be executed. But in prison, he had a vision when it, while engulfed in tribulations, I heard a most wondrous, a most sweet voice calling above my head. I beheld a maiden 
pointing with her finger unto my head. By God, this is the best beloved of the words, worlds, and yet you comprehend not. This is the beauty of God amongst you, and the power of his sovereignty within you, could you but understand. This is the mystery of God and his treasure. Um, most of the letters I'm going to talk about are reprinted in a, a book called The Summons of the Lord of Hosts. He later explained that when he was in that prison and he heard this voice, after that, he felt like a stream of knowledge came to him and he suddenly realized that he could understand everything. He was then exiled from Persia. He survived the Black Pit and was exiled from Iran in 1853 for various reasons, which I won't go into, but uh, largely to do with the intervention of the Russian ambassador, but also the fact that his father was one of the Shah's ministers. He was repeatedly moved on to new exiles, to Baghdad, which, of course, we all know where it is now in Iraq. Um, he spent two years as a hermit in the mountains of uh, Kurdistan. And then, after four more years in Baghdad, he was summoned by the Sultan's leading minister to go to the Ottoman capital, I Istanbul. He'd been effectively, if you like, tra transferred as a prisoner from the Shah to the um, Sultan. And on the journey, he was escorted by Ottoman soldiers, Turkish soldiers. At his departure, he was fated by the people of the city, Baghdad. And then he declared publicly that he was the manifestation of God for this age. Now, this event, if you read about it, will probably remind you of Palm Sunday in the story of Christ. At the same time where everybody seems to be... Um, fating Christ, and yet a few days later, hardly anybody will when the pressure is put upon them. But um, the ministers did not allow him to meet the sultan because they were afraid that he, uh, the sultan might be um, converted to his religion. The same thing had happened in Iran, actually, when the Shah had wanted to meet him but not been allowed to by his ministers. And he was forcibly exiled then yet again to Edirne. Now, Edirne um, was previously called Adrianople after the Roman Emperor Hadrian and was um, then a good 800 miles with it inside the Ottoman Empire. But now it's right on the boundary between Bulgaria and Turkey. And from Edirne, he was sent in 1868 to the most severe prison in the whole Ottoman Empire, Akka. Uh, the acre of crusader times, a walled city inhabited only by condemned criminals, soldiers and civil servants. He called the citadel here the most great prison. Now, many of you, I noticed there's somebody on the call here who is either a Rushdie or married to a Rushdie. Many of you will have noted that most of the um, administrative staff and the guards in the most great prison were in fact Egyptians. And this is because the um, Ottoman province of Palestine had been passed to the governor of Egypt to govern in exchange for um, putting down the Greek revolt. So this is why many um, early Baha'is from there actually were Egyptians. I, I have a friend whose two grandfathers were the doctor, um, put by the locals to look after Baha'u'llah and the captain of the guard of the prison. Here's a map to show you um, the uh, situation at the time. You can see the successive ex exiles. The dark brown on this map is the extent of the Ottoman Empire at the time, i.e. the Turkish Empire. And you can see that Edirne or Adrianople was then well within the empire. The real question is, how did a prisoner in the Ottomans' toughest prison write to the kings and rulers of the world, not just write to them, but comment upon their motivation and sometimes rebuke them? Remember that there was at the time a kind of ethnocentrism, if you like, of white supremacy. 
So he would automatically probably have been looked down on by most of his recipients. You know, it's remarked now that, of course, even Abraham Lincoln found it hard to imagine absolute equality. Thank God the earth has moved on. But uh, it, it's in some ways small wonder that people had a prejudice, possibly. King, a king would have a prejudice. Who on earth is this man? And yet this man wrote to them with majesty. Even the strictest governors of the city of Acre came to admire him and took his advice. And always they were replaced. Every three or four years they were replaced by some new strong man that would come in and be nasty again. And then he too would be won over by Baha'u'llah and he'd have to be replaced and some other hard man would be brought in and so on. Um, uh, I would witness uh, Salah Jarrah said of Baha'u'llah's son Abdul Baha, and it's probably even more true of Baha'u'llah. He was a prisoner, but he was the king of Akka. The same was probably even more true of Baha'u'llah. Now, you may ask, well, why didn't he write to the rulers of Asia and Africa? Bear in mind that by 1885, in those two continents, only Ethiopia, Japan, Thailand and Korea and Iran itself were completely outside the control of those to whom he wrote. But of course, he wrote to the Shah as well. Uh, even China had considerable European enclaves within it. So there was, his few recipients could have changed the world at this point. You may come back and you will say, well, hang on, Latin America had a great swathe of independent countries, and indeed, indeed it did, and had since 1820, basically. Um, but he wrote a single letter to the presidents of Amer the American republics, which was addressed to uh, the US president, but was in to include the presidents of Brazil, or the emperor of Brazil at the time, of course, the, uh, the president of Chile, the president of Argentina, etc. cetera. Um, one big question is, given that Andrew Johnson was president until March 1869, and uh, Ulysses Grant took over in March 1869. We don't quite know which uh, American president would have received this letter or whose administration would have received it. On balance, we think Grant, but uh, we can't be absolutely certain. But, uh, the prison city of Arca, of course, now is rather wonderful for tourists and so on. But in those days, it was rather ghastly, partly because the um, predominant sea currents, and you'll notice that I have, um, if I have any experience at all, it's mostly to do with marine things. Um, the sea currents basically funneled all sort of nasty stuff in the Mediterranean, of which there's lots and even more in those days, um, down to the end around Acre, so the waters were foul and and the whole the air was was horrible of course main aim was that you send your murderers there put them in prison there and they die but um so the idea was that Baha'u'llah would be forgotten and the first place that he and uh 73 colleagues were confined was in two windows in this citadel um when he arrived in 1868 all the um, ordinary decent common criminals, the murderers and robbers and other people, gathered to uh, jeer at the newcomers because while they might be convicted criminals, at least they weren't heretics like these new people. Baha'u'llah's daughter recounts in a very, really quite poignant way, all the townspeople had assembled to see the arrival of the prisoners Having been told that we were infidels, criminals, and sowers of sedition, the attitude of the crowd was threatening. The yelling and curses and execrations filled us with fresh misery. We were terrified of the unknown. We knew not what the fate of our party, the friends, and ourselves would be. We were taken to the old fortress of Acre, where we were crowded together. That's what I'm just showing you the picture of. There was no air. A small quantity of very bad coarse bread was produced. We were unable to get fresh water to drink. Our sufferings were not diminished. 
Then an epidemic of typhoid broke out. Nearly all became ill and a couple died. But Baha'u'llah explains as he entered the city, he heard a voice say, soon will all that dwell on earth be enlisted under these banners. And again, you think of the story of Christ uh, when he's baptized, he hears this voice um, talking to him. OK, let's deal with the letters, the nature of the letters. He started writing letters from Edirna, from Adrian Apol. Um, he wrote from Edirna to the Sultan, his jailer, basically, uh, to the Sultan's two chief ministers. And we think the first of two letters he wrote to Napoleon III. I mean, we know that he wrote two letters to Napoleon III, but we're not absolutely certain whether it went from Edirna or it went from the ship or whether it went from Acre. But it's, we think it went from Edirna. Um, and uh, the letters that he wrote, as I said, included presidents of the American republics as well as kings. And also he wrote to the two Turkish chief ministers to whom he about whom he were, he was quite rude. He was very polite to monarchs generally. And some of his letters were to kings and rulers in general, particularly those which urged them to take counsel together to reduce their armaments, etc. Now, to me, it's insufficient just to ask, hey, what did Baha'u'llah say to King so-and-so, whatever? Because every letter is a masterpiece, and it's not just about the person that receives it. Most of the letters include theology, advice on creating world peace. And often, uh, particularly when writing to the Sultan, um, complaining about the treatment of the children, the Baha'i children, um, in the prison. Now, by the, cl the close of the scramble for Africa in 1887, these monarchs were going to rule most of the world. Baha'u'llah was usually very kind of polite, even to those who received an element of criticism. Uh, he says to Napoleon III, who he does actually uh, tell in no uncertain terms that he's going to lose his throne pretty immediately, it is not our wish to address the words of co condemnation out of regard to the dignity we confirm it upon thee in this mortal life. How were the letters delivered? They were written mostly in Arabic. Um, that to the Shah was delivered through Bardi. Um, that's another story, I think, which were, hopefully Oakville will have a talk on if it hasn't already. A young, a young teenager. Uh, most were delivered through consuls. Um, Jan Yashin, uh, an, another distinguished Canadian, has um, written extensively about the different consuls. There were, some countries had a consul in Haifa, some in Jerusalem, um, some in Acre, some in Beirut, um, some in any two or three of those four. And we, we do know where most of them went. Which were received, we're not really sure. Um, most were sent in 1868-69. That to the German emperor clearly was in 1871 since it refers to the fall of Napoleon III as having already happened. Now, you might ask the question, if somebody wrote to President Trudeau now, would, would he read it? That, I think, is the wrong question to ask, because the amount of information available to an individual, whether a monarch or not, or president or not, was so much less then than it is today. There is in the public record office at Kew here in London, well, there in London, I should say, because I'm in Oxford, um, a letter in the hand of uh, the British consul, um, Lord Justin Scheel in um, Tehran, explaining in great detail about the martyrdom of the Barb, the execution of the Barb, and about the Navy's upheaval and so on, written in his own hand, and it was replied to by the Secretary of State, uh, the Foreign Secretary, we would call them, Lord Palmerston. So it's quite clear that certainly Her Majesty's government here in Britain was well aware of uh, what they called the episode of the Barb. They were well aware of Baha'u'llah. And indeed, again, Yan Yashin has shown 
um, that the first mention of the Baha'i faith in most American states, for instance, was before the end of 1848, far earlier than possibly most of us would have imagined. And he's also done the same thing for countries of Europe, etc. Um, <clears throat> so don't assume that monarchs would not know of these letters. Uh, the way it's generally done in foreign policy terms is for officials to make a selection and then say to the recipient, we've got these letters that say this, 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 and this. This is certainly the way that Queen Elizabeth II used to do it. And she would say, can you read me this one and this one and this one? So we have heard it said that Queen Victoria said, um, if this man is of God, it can do, do no, um, it will endure. If not, it can do no harm. And to some people, it might seem strange that that, that would be possible. But having seen how um, much effort was put in by the foreign secretary themselves and informing the monarch and informing the prime minister on many other foreign policy issues, I could well believe that it, it, it was referred to Queen Victoria. Um, if nothing else, the British government was obsessed with keeping the Russians out of India. So Persia and Afghanistan were, were to them places where Britain needed influence because they didn't want the Russians to have influence. Okay, um, here's a map. Now, if you were younger, I would be asking you, what, how is this different from the map now? But of course, you all know this anyway. You just have a look at it. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, of course, is uh, conspicuous by its absence. You will see that the Republic of Ireland is um, part of Britain. You will see that Algeria is part of France, not just France outre-mer, but actually metropolitan France. You will see that the Ottoman control over what's called the Hejaz, what's now Saudi Arabia, is incomplete. You will notice that Russia came a lot further west, uh, places like Poland and Belarus and Moldova and so on were all Russia. You will see that um, Norway was part of Sweden, Finland was part of Russia. Uh, in this map, Italy is one country, but it was not. It had only just become so in 1861. In 1867, it was one country. It wasn't before that. You'll notice that Germany is in lots of little bits. So that's that's the situation. Why have I shown you the situation in 1867? Because that's when Baha'u'llah's first letters went out. And you will see that a lot, a lot of changes happened just in the four years that he was writing these letters. And partly, of course, the prophet, some of the prophecies that he made had come true by them. I want to um, now focus on about three major recipients, and then I will uh, whip through the rest pretty quickly, or some of the rest, and ignore the no others. Pius the Ninth, in Italian, Pio no no, and of course the word no in Italian means the same as no in English, uh, and therefore this this was a pun upon his name. Uh, he was, of course, not only the Pontiff, uh, the Pope, but he was also the king of the, the papal states, which were quite considerable. Those of you familiar with the Borgias will know that Cesare Borgia spent a lot of time conquering a lot of central Italy, and this was still owned by the papacy by uh, the 1840s, but most of it was gone in 1848. Here's, here's a map of the Kingdom of Italy in 1867. Interesting question, of course, what do they do? Well, they they claim that Corsica and Switzerland is really Italy, but as yet we don't quite have it. You know, that's the kind of line taken. Um, you will notice that they put the Roma zone. Why do they put that? Because it is part of Italy, but actually it was French troops were stopping the Italian nationalists from incorporating it uh, at the time. Pius the Ninth um, ministry falls into three phases, really. Before 1848, he was a modernizer, an advocate of constitutional monarchy. The Italian nationalists, in fact, asked him to lead Italy and drive the Austrians out of the north uh, eastern Italy, Lombardy and Venetia. 
1848, 1849, there's a massive series of nationalist, liberal nationalist revolutions all over Europe. And indeed, there's a lot of upheaval in Iran, too, for different, different reasons. And um, the Italian nationalists Mazzini and Garibaldi took control of Rome and the Papal States in the name of a united Italy. Um, 1849, the French emperor had offended the Catholics somewhat, so he decided he would try to cheer them up a bit. So he sent French troops to throw the Italian nationalists out of Rome, and then he propped up the papacy uh, as king of Rome. The Italian nationalists did not want to get rid of the head of their church. They just didn't want him to be king anymore. But um, Napoleon III basically put a ring of steel around Rome, made the Pope just king of Rome itself, and he then became an arch-conservative. Uh, from 1860, he's lost the rest of um, the Papal States. And after 1870, after Baha'u'llah's letter, in which Baha'u'llah says to him, abandon your kingdom unto the kings. Um, the Prussians invaded France after France declared war on Prussia. Napoleon III withdrew his troops from Rome. The Italian nationalists walked in, incorporated Rome as their capital. And from then on, Pius IX described himself as the prisoner of the Vatican. Now, we're all familiar with the idea of papal infallibility, but that, that actually isn't an ancient idea. That was declared in 1871. From now on, the Pope is infallible in spiritual matters, but extremely infallible in practical matters. Now, some people have said to me, hang on, mate, you're being an idiot here. The Pope never lost his kingdom, because what about the Vatican City is now an independent state? Well, so it is. But actually, that situation only dates from the Lateran Treaty of 1929. So between 1870 and 1929, there was no Vatican City. So when Baha'u'llah said, abandon your kingdom unto the kings, pretty quickly, uh, the Pope was forced to do just that. Um, he still, he still maintained this extremely conservative stance he wrote to the king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel, uh, opposing free universal education, despite the fact that his country was 75% illiterate. But uh, nevertheless, in 2000, he was beatified. So um, the main points of the message to the Pope. First, reference to Christian prophecy. The Lord of Lord is come, overshadowed with clouds. He's come down again from heaven, even as he came down from it the first time. In other words, Figuratively. He also says Jesus lived in poverty. Why does the Pope need all these palaces? Which is a good point. Abandon thy kingdom unto the kings. He also reminds uh, His Holiness that the Pharisees disputed with Jesus and he asked His Holiness not to do the same with Baha'u'llah and to warn peoples of all faith of the parallel. But I said he was extremely respectful. He treated the king, the Pope, as the leader of Christendom, and he speaks to Christians, to monks, through the Pope, even though the, obviously the, many, many uh, Christians are Protestants. He compares himself to Christ in saying that, thus do we make plain unto you the path of him whom the Spirit prophesied. I verily bear witness unto him, even as he hath borne witness unto me. Verily he said, that's Christ said, come ye after me and I will make you to become fishes of men. In this day, however, we say, come ye after me, that we may make you to become quickeners of mankind. This doth have the de decree been inscribed in this tablet by the pen of revelation. Had we more time, I would make some suggestions to what that might mean, but we do not. Napoleon III. Um, he obviously either had a, a very um, sympathetic artist or he really was a handsome man. You can see him on the left here, uh, dressed in all his finery, obviously trying to look like his uncle. One of the things which led me to start a study of this 
um, these letters. And in fact, I'm hoping um, to complete a book for George Ronald, which is a Baha'i publisher, by the end of next year, this year, on it, was the fact that I discovered that some people, some Baha'is knew that Baha'u'llah went to Napoleon III and thought it was Napoleon the Great. Well, Napoleon the Great was born in 1769. So he would, such a man would have been 100 when Baha'u'llah wrote to him. But I realized that there was a bit of education required. These are different pictures of Napoleon III. Uh, born um, Louis Bonaparte. Let's listen to his history. He was the son of Napoleon's brother, King Louis I of Holland. As Napoleon conquered bits of Europe, he often made his brothers or um, cousins kings of places. Once Napoleon I is um, defeated in 1815, when he met his Waterloo, um, Napoleon III, Louis Napoleon, becomes a commoner. And he tries to seize the throne of France, but he's then imprisoned for rebellion, in theory for life. But he escapes. He then worked as a docker in New York City, a longshoreman. And he, although he was short, he was a very good runner. So he would bet people that he could beat them in a race. And um, they, all, they didn't believe he could, but he won a lot of money that way. Then when the year of revolutions occurred, he came and he worked as um, a, a special constable in London during the Chartist demonstrations in 1848. These were people um, wanting uh, suffrage reform. Um, the, with the abdication of French King Louis Philippe in 1848, uh, Mr. Bonaparte moved to Paris and he stood for election as president in the, in the new Second Republic. And he won 75% of the vote because he had the name recognition. You know, some people, it's quite clear, did believe that this was a return of the emperor himself, uh, Napoleon the Great. And then he carried out a coup in 1851 and declared himself emperor. Why didn't he choose the name Napoleon II? The reason for that is because he was only second in line to the throne after, after Napoleon I. Napoleon I had a son who sadly died uh, as, a, as a boy who would have been Napoleon II. So no, if he were legitimate, um, this guy would have been Napoleon III. Now, all of you are familiar with the cult of celebrity, which we have now where we have magazines and we have TV programs devoted to people we've not even heard of, who, but we have to believe they're celebrities. So somebody must have heard of them. Uh, and sometimes they're famous for really quite shocking things. It wasn't quite like that in the past. There weren't as many celebrities. And of course, partly that was because there was not the media and th there was certainly no color printing. Uh, but the Empress Eugenie, Napoleon's wife, um, if I had, do I have anyone here, Spanish, that can pronounce this? Her name? Any Spanish speakers? Okay, I'll try myself. Donna Maria Eugenia Ignacia Agustina de Palafox y Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick being uh, a place in Ireland. She was the original kind of Lady Diana, um, Jacqueline Kennedy of her day. Um, she was young, she was pretty, she had um, lots of nice palaces, lots of jewelry, she smiled. She understood that Napoleon III was the people's emperor. And therefore, she was willing to mix with crowds in the ways that, say, the Austro-Hungarian uh, emperors were not willing to. They had beautiful summer palace at Biritz. Also, um, the uh, discovery of purple dyes, how to make decent purple dyes uh, from coal tar, happened during her um, reign as emperor, empress. And... She, she was the first person really to have purple dresses since the days of the Romans when purple was actually 
reserved for emperors because the only way to make purple in Roman times was from uh, murex, various um, sea creatures that were extremely expensive and rare and so on, and lo localized. Uh, and the year after Empress Eugenie was seen in her purple dress, uh, probably the balls and the ballrooms of Europe were just filled with women in purple dresses. So it's a bit the same as, as Jacqueline Anassis. The minute she appeared with pillbox hats, all of a sudden uh, women had pillbox hats in great numbers. You know, and, and the Empress Eugenie was the first modern celebrity, female celebrity in that way. Now, Napoleon III, in many ways, had some good qualities. I'll, um, you'll all be familiar with uh, Napoleon III. You'll be familiar with Mark Twain. If you um, go along Lake Superior, but then uh, go over Sault Ste. Marie, go down through Michigan, then down through Illinois, and you get to Hannibal in, in Missouri. That's where Mark Twain came from, Samuel Clemens. And he went on a tour of Europe, really the first um, package tour of Americans. And he saw both Napoleon III and Sultan Abdulaziz, two of the people I'm going to mention. He wasn't polite about them. So I'm, I'm not arguing that you agree with his view. I, I just think it's rather nice to have a a bystander who saw these people, Napoleon in military uniform, a long-bodied, short-legged man, fiercely moustached, old, wrinkled, with eyes half closed, and such a deep, crafty, scheming expression about them. Napoleon, bowing ever so gently to the loud plaudits, and watching everything and everybody with his cat eyes from under his depressed hat brim, as if to discover any sign these cheers were not heartfelt and cordial. That's only Mark Twain's opinion, but he actually was obsessed, obsessed with popularity. He rebuilt Paris with broad boulevard, looked beautiful, but also much harder to have a rebellion and put up barricades as it already happened to three previous French monarchs. He rearmed France, so it was the most powerful country in Europe. He helped the Italian nationalists drive the Austrians out of Lombardy and Venetia. Um, but he also offended them then by keeping them from Rome. And also he took Savoy and Nice from them, previously been part of uh, the kingdom of, of Sardinia. He went to war with Russia with British help to back up the Turks in 1853 in the Crimea. He invaded Mexico and put an Austrian prince, Maximilian von Habsburg, on the throne. And as soon as the USA threatened him, pulled his troops out and Maximilian was executed. He bullied the other churches and the Muslim authorities in Jerusalem in the interests of Roman Catholic monks. So he was a supreme meddler. He wanted to be popular and he destabilised Europe. By, and indeed the world in a way, by creating all these different problems. So what did Baha'u'llah say to Napoleon III? He sent him two messages. And the first of which Baha'u'llah himself tells us, Napoleon III cast behind him contemptuously. Baha'u'llah speaks to Napoleon of, of how Christ had been missed. Don't make the same mistake again. He tells Napoleon III that Napoleon's public statement that he had only entered the Crimean War to protect the oppressed was untrue. God knows what you really thought. We tested thee and found thee wanting, which is almost a quote from Nebuchadnezzar, the writings on the war. So again, biblical reference there. And he says to Napoleon III, for what thou hast done, thy kingdom shall be thrown into confusion and thine empire shall pass from thine hands as a punishment for that which thou hast wrought. He tells him to look after the poor. And he also writes a lot more things. He said that this cause should be taught through the power of utterance, not through weapon or anything. OK, so what happened? Rapid demotion. Here's a guy, the most powerful monarch in the world. We have a tendency now to think that that was Queen Victoria. But in fact, at the time, everyone would have agreed, including Queen Victoria, 
that it was Napoleon the third. I mean, he had a million men under arms, which is ridiculous for a country of that size. They fell out, France and Prussia, which was the biggest power in Germany, fell out over the Spanish throne. Uh, Napoleon III declared war on Prussia. Why? Because he wanted a victory to make him even more popular at home. If you look at the Times for those days, if you can't find a copy of the Times for 1870, just go to my dentist. They've got the, a pile of really old newspapers there. Um, British commentators thought that France would beat Prussia hands down. No such luck. The other German states backed Prussia because clearly the France was the aggressor. And the Germans had, had created a railway system, but the French had hardly any. So they were able to shift troops all over. And the emperor and the large army were captured at northeast France. He was spat at by his own soldiers. He then came over, over here to where I am, spent a year in Leamington Spa, and then he went to Chislehurst in Kent and died in 1873. Um, he's now buried in Farnborough in Hampshire at a place we usually created for him. And uh, President um, Macron has asked that the bodies of Napoleon III and Eugenie, and indeed their son, the Prince Imperial, should be returned to France. So this may happen pretty soon, that they may be reburied at Les Invalides in Paris. They had a son, the Prince Imperial, who was in the British Army and was killed in 1879 in the Zulu War. Queen Victoria was devastated. She had never very much liked Napoleon III, but she, but she wanted a monarchy. And she thought that this man would go back from Britain and be the emperor of France. But this was the end of the dynasty, really, sadly. OK, Alexander II, Tsar of all the Russias. To him, Baha'u'llah writes a short and positive letter. Um, Alexander's ambassador had interceded with the Shah. Alexander II had freed the serfs in 1861, more or less the same time as Lincoln freed the slaves. He introduced courts, local government, cor corporal punishment, but he was assassinated by communist revolutions in 1881. The sixth attempt um, on his life, one of the um, attempts was by Lenin's elder brother. And of course, his whole family was murdered, uh, his descendants in Ekaterinburg in 1918. Queen Victoria. I'm sorry to rush through these, but I know time is. Um, he shows Queen Victoria how he fulfilled biblical prophecies. And he basically says three main things to her. One, he congratulates her on the forbidding the trading of slaves. In fact, of course, the trading of slaves was forbidden in 1807, but the actual slave slavery within the British Empire was not abolished until 1833. Secondly, he congratulates her on constitutional monarchy. And thirdly, he tells her that that, that which the Lord hath ordained as the sovereign re remedy and mightiest instrument for the healing of all the world is the union of all its peoples in one universal cause, one common faith. He then writes as it, to her on behalf of all the monarchs and tells them to reduce their armaments, tells them that their people are their treasures. These two passages here really speak to me. Nasruddin Shah, you can see that um, he's probably as brave a man as a Russian general, the number of uh, medals he's got. Um, pretty impressive. Um, this one is Medern. This is a literary ma masterpiece. If you haven't read it, read it. Whither are gone the learned men, the divines and potentates of old? What became of their discriminating views, their shrewd perceptions, their subtle insights and sage pronouncements? Where are their hidden coffers, their flaunted ornaments, their gilded couches, their rugs and cushions? Strewn about. This is not just an everyday letter. This is 
a work of art, really. Now, even the Shah, who has kept him in his dungeon, he says, with thy love in my heart, nothing can ever alarm me. And he says, have I, king, ever disobeyed thee? And actually, they would have known each other as boys because Baha'u'llah's father was one of the ministers and one of the chief nobles. So, as I said, he's polite, even, even to his captors. Um, he proves his cause from Christianity and Islam, and he asks the king to go easy on the Baha'is in Persia. Abdul Aziz, um, servant of the beloved. Not only Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, but also declared himself Caliph of Sunni Islam, as, as his uh, ancestors had for 200 years. Um, Baha'u'llah wrote unflattering letters to the two chief ministers. He calls the Sultan the King of Islam as Caliph. And again, he said, have I, O King, ever disobeyed thee? And he also warns the king about corrupt ministers. He says, know that for certainty that whoso disbelievers in God is neither trustworthy nor truthful. He also um, complains about the fact that the children uh, of Baha'is have suffered. Uh, but he, he also talks about not with, placing reliance on your treasures. Now, here's what Mark Twain says about Abdelaziz. Abdelaziz, absolute lord of the Ottoman Empire, clad in dark green European clothes, almost without ornament or insignia of rank, a red Turkish fez on his head, a short, stout, dark man, black-bearded, black-eyed, stupid, unprepossessing, a man whose whole appearance somehow suggested that if he only had a cleaver in his hand and a white apron on, one would not at all be surprised to hear him say, a mutton roast today, or will you have a nice port porterhouse steak? I, 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 I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying this is what Mark Twain, who was, of course, a, a humorous writer, said about him. But he did, he did watch him in Paris. The representative of a people by nature and training, filthy, brutish, ignorant, unprogressive, superstitious, and a government whose three graces are tyranny, capacity, blood. Born to a throne. Weak, stupid, ignorant, almost as his meanest slave, who sleeps, sleeps, eats, eats, idles with his 800 concubines, who found his great empire a blot upon the earth, a degraded, poverty-stricken, miserable, infamous agglomeration of ignorance, crime and brutality, and will idle away the allotted days of his trivial life and then pass to the dust and the worms and leave it so. Why have I read you that? Because imagine, if that's what Mark Twain thought about Ottoman Empire, how easy was it for European kings and emperors to take seriously, unless they read it, a letter from a prisoner of the Ottomans, a guy imprisoned from this area of the world that they thought was backward. This is the um, harem in uh, Istanbul, where these 800 concubines live. OK, I, for speed, I won't go through this, but you can see um, you can see he writes very rude uh, letters to these guys, uh, the, the ministers, because he says they're corrupt. And he also uh, tells them off for not having stopped a, um, an epidemic, they've done anything to step on epic epidemic. Maybe they were anti-vaxxers, you know, we hear these kind of people today, maybe they, that's what they were. I just want to mention uh, one thing about this. He called the land around Iderna the land of mystery, and this is another prophecy. The day is approaching when the land of mystery and what is beside it shall be changed and shall pass out of the hands of the king and commotion shall appear, etc. And uh, that sounds unlikely. There you are. There's the Ottoman Empire. You can see Iderna is... Uh, almost down at the Black Sea, and the Ottoman Empire includes lots of Europe. But pretty soon, everything has changed. He said conditions will wax grievous. Eterna becomes beset by armies for the next 40 years. And even as late as the 1990s, of course, petty nationalism was costing lives in, 
in the Balkans, and Iderna changed hands many times. The land of mystery passed completely out of the hands of the king, but the city itself is now back in, in Turkey. Bahá'u'lláh predicted this would happen. It happened remarkably quickly. Um, what happened to the Ottoman royal family? Too many concubines. Too many concubines, too many children, too many men that think they should be monarch. And all of these nephews of um, Sultan Abdulaziz were emperor one after another. Eventually, the Young Turk Rebellion throws, uh, takes away the um, absolute monarchy and frees all the prisoners in Acre. And when uh, Cable came from Constantinople, free all the prisoners, the governor of Acre is scared and he, he sends another Cable back to Constantinople, Istanbul. Do you mean even the Baha'is? And the answer comes back, yes, even the Baha'is. And this is why Abdul Baha is able to come to Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal and so on, uh, because he was freed by the Young Turk Rebellion in 1908. And um, the caliphate is abolished in 1924. And a lot of these uh, jihadists these days, the one thing they think will would be nice would be to have a caliphate again. But uh, the caliphate is finished. Almost finished, Franz Joseph. Now, this is a royal family that's lasted since 1020. 1020. Great talent for marrying for land. They ruled much of South America, Austria, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, half of Italy. They were Holy Roman emperors. They conquered Hungary, Poland, Bosnia. Trouble is they intermarried with relatives and they produced lots and lots of disabled people. The poet Baha'u'llah only wrote a short letter to Franz Joseph, just saying it was a shame he hadn't come to see him, as it were, when he came to the Holy Land. Uh, his family ceased because his brother was let down by Napoleon III when he was emperor of Mexico and got killed by the Mexican nationalists. Um, his son uh, committed suicide with his girlfriend in 1889. Um, his nephew was assassinated by Prinkep, um, Bosnian nationalist, uh, sorry, Serbian nationalist in um, Sarajevo in 1914, which is often given as the immediate spark for the First World War. So the Habsburgs, this family which had lasted since 1020, disappeared. Wilhelm I, now another prophecy here, the Hohenzollerns, the kings of Prussia, who became emperor of, emperor of Germany in 1870, starting with a rather small part of Germany called Brandenburg, they ended up uh, the most powerful monarchs in Europe after the defeat of Napoleon III and declared the German Empire. Here he is with Otto von Bismarck. What does Baha'u'llah say to him? He writes him in 1871. And he says, take heed, lest pride debar thee from recognizing the day spring of divine re revelation. And he reminds him of Napoleon III and what happened to him. He cast the tablet of God behind him. And all of a sudden, disgrace assailed him from all sides. And then he makes two remarkable prophecies. O banks of the Rhine, we have seen you covered with gore inasmuch as the swords of retribution were drawn against you, perhaps the first war. And you shall have another turn, perhaps the second war. And we hear the lamentations of Berlin, though she be today in conspicuous glory. Berlin, a city divided from 1948 until um, about 1989. Now, the funny thing about these prophecies is that in 1917, when the Germans seemed to be winning the First World War, the uh, Iranian clergy thought it was a good idea to declare these prophecies from the pulpit in Iran and tell everybody, look, Baha'u'llah told the, uh, the emperor of Germany that Germany was going to be the loser from these occasions, and yet here's Germany winning. 
And the following year, when the, the German army collapsed, you know, they, they, they themselves had made Baha'u'llah's words familiar to many people all over Iran. Rather funny, really. The Kaiser, um, like Emperor Franz Joseph, deposed by his people at the end of the First World War. Until 1966, no von Habsburg was allowed to enter Austria. There's now a, um, an Austrian MP, Karl von Habsburg. Uh, the Kaiser lived until 1941. Um, his heir lived until 1951. And his heir, in, in return, was killed in, in the war in 1940. So there's no, uh, there's no direct descendant. There is still a Prince of Prussia, but he has no prerogatives. I've whipped through this. I've probably been incomprehensible. There's a lot to it. Read the summons of the Lord of Hosts. And if you see any George Ronald books come out on the subject, read that. Um, Madam, my case rests. Your case rests. <laughs> well, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Victor's. Vickers, you Stephen, invited please. me to call you Stephen, so I will do so just out of respect, um, but uh, you you really presented um, a phenomenal amount of information for us to digest, and uh, I can say that for someone who, who is uh, lacking in my history knowledge, um, that was a, a really great overview and um, also depth of knowledge too. I only just hope your, de your dentist wasn't watching. Um, and if he was, maybe he'll get the message that it's time to renew his magazine subscriptions in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In fact, um, of course, uh, with um, COVID, they all vanished. Uh, oh, all, all, we, they, they were no longer giving us bits of paper which could pass uh, things away. So um, uh, those old days when you could go and look, look into early history and read Ancient magazines have long gone, sadly, but That's it was right. 20 and, years ago. And now we realize how how dirty they must have been all along without <laughs> without <laughs> us actually stopping to think about it, along with other uh, regular practices like blowing out the candles on your birthday cake. These are <laughs> no longer practices thanks to COVID. Um, Stephen, that was that was phenomenal. I'm very glad to hear that you're working on a book, and um, thank you for mentioning that because. You've wet our appetite, and uh, I would I would really be um, uh, the first in line to buy it. What will be the name of it? Wait and see. <laughs> but I, I, I can assure you that my mentioning is purely self interest. No, it well, isn't. I think it's it it is a remarkable. A lot of these prophecies would be very hard to explain away. You know. Yeah. Um, there's a young lady um, standing in front of the Shrine of the Bob there that's going to say something, I think. All right. Thank you. Yes, we can open for questions. If you'd like to send your question to me through the chat, then I'll present it. Otherwise, um, please put up your hand. So uh, go ahead, Gati. Uh, Dr. Vickers, thank you so much. This was remarkable. It was just amazing. I did not understand the significance of Mark Twain's comments on Sultan. Right. Why did, why, uh, on, uh, on Sultan Abdul Aziz or either of them? Say it again. Did, did you mean his comment on Abdul Aziz or both yes, his comment? Yes, yes, yes. I, I okay. did not understand the significance of it. Okay. The important thing is, uh, in my humble opinion, which is very opinionated and not very humble, uh, when you're looking into history, is to get what we might call a triangulation on it. If we do not have other contemporary accounts of people or things, it's very easy to make of history a kind of fairy story, a fable. And this is a real man whom you as uh, North Americans will be very familiar with and who was a journalist and also one of the best uh, of 19th century writers who actually met, he actually met Alexander II, for instance, but I didn't quote him. He only saw 
uh, in a parade, Abdelaziz and Napoleon III. But it's interesting because, uh, as I said, Napoleon III was something of an enigma. He, he was, uh, he did a lot of very good modernizing things. He made ordinary French people much better off than they were. He modernized France. And yet, on the other hand, with his foreign policy fiddling around and scheming, he made the world a less safe place. And it was the fact that Mark Twain picks out these elements and Baha'u'llah picks out these same elements when he writes to them. So what I was doing really was to use this, to, to use the Napoleon III in support of this enigmatic aspect. You know, Baha'u'llah congratulates him on some things and tells him off for others. And similarly, when we're dealing with Sultan Abdelaziz, this was to remind you how the average prejudiced Westerner thought of the Ottoman Empire. They thought of it as backward. They, they, they disliked the fact that the emperor had 800 concubines. They disliked the fact that the emperor believed in genies and was not at all interested in science. And from that point of view, imagine, would you, had you received a letter from Baha'u'llah, at the time, have seen that somebody from a prison in this part of the world that you look down on might have been such a wonderful person. Once you'd opened the letter, if you got a pure heart, you would realize there's something special about it. But it, it's it's not hard to understand why some people would have failed the first test because of their prejudice. And yes, uh, Mark Twain's view is was prejudiced, but he was a, a witness. There were very few people who have done as detailed accounts of these monarchs from a Western perspective as he has. And I could have I could have selected a lot. As I said, he met and spoke to the Pope. He met and spoke to um Alexander II because these people were keen to uh impress Americans. So since this was a tour of well-to-do Americans, a lot of monarchs made space for them to meet them in a way they never would now. Thank you so much. That's I, I will uh, read a question in the chat and it's about the actual physical letters. So do we know where the letter to Queen Victoria is now? Is it in the British archives? And maybe I can add on to Louise and Bob's question if, if we know of uh, where any of the letters are. Um, yes, <laughs> the, the letter to Queen Victoria is in the British Museum, in fact. Um, things which are considered um, the, the normal place where public archives in Britain are put is the public record office at Kew, where the letter, the correspondence between Lord Justin Shield and Lord Palmerston about the episode of the Barb is written. <clears throat> but, the, but this one was transferred to the British Museum. Why? Because about five or six years ago, the British Museum had a display on... Baha'i history. Um, it would have been for, it would have been 1917. It, it, it would have, sorry, 2017. It would have been the bicentennial of the birth of Baha'u'llah. They had a whole room and they had many things which even the Baha'is were surprised that they had. And, and so that's actually in the British Museum. Um, the the one to the Ottoman Sultan is definitely in the uh, Turkish archives. There's a chap in Denmark, um, a, a Persian, uh, a, a university lecturer of Persian descent in Denmark, who has done a lot of work on um, the Turkish archives. And one of the interesting things that he's shown 
is that all during Baha'u'llah's imprisonment in uh, Akka, the Persian and Austrian foreign ministries, sorry, the Persian and Ottoman foreign ministries were corresponding with each other about Baha'u'llah. Why? Partly because, of course, um, with the persecution, Babism and Baha'i had gone underground, as it were, in Iran. And, and there was that feeling from um, Iranian government that possibly there might be, I don't know, two, three million secret Baha'is who might suddenly get up and sweep them away. So it was this nervousness. And the, um, the Ottomans were concerned because they knew um, that Baha'u'llah had support uh, quite over the Middle, Middle East of people who had never actually come out uh, openly to claim uh, that they were followers of Baha'u'llah. They were again concerned that they might have, if you like, this secret society among them. Um, and it's not it's not absolutely ridiculous because if you look at the Druze beliefs, the, not uh, the, the Druze, you know, the Druze community of southern Lebanon and northern Israel, they have a belief in a number of holy people. And one of those is Baha'u'llah. They've added him to their um, list list of, of holy men. I don't know how many they have. There haven't been a lot of written Western accounts of Druze beliefs, but there was um, an encyclopedia that came out about, out about 30 years ago that dealt with this. But also the Persians were obsessed, asking the Ottomans, what is Baha'u'llah saying about us? Is, is he insulting Persia? And and so there's a lot of stuff there. And the other the other place is Russia. Russia has most of the German archives, and possibly the letter to um, the Kaiser, and certainly has the letter to Alexander II. We owe this survival, these survivals, to the paranoia of Joe Stalin. You know, he tried to collect everything. So they have in their archives almost everything from anywhere where Russian boots have trod. And there is a lot of stuff to come out. I don't know where the French one is. The American one is certainly in the Library of Congress. Um, so most of them are certainly still extant. Um, the one we're not very certain of, but that's because I'm not really an expert, is the first letter of Napoleon the, to Napoleon the Third, and almost we I only know that its existence because Baha'u'llah tells us that he sent it and that Napoleon had cast it behind him. So it's quite possible that that was never kept; that he might actually physically have, as it were, screwed it up and chucked it in the bin or whatever. But yes, most of them are still in the National Archives, and that's of these countries. And that sounds bizarre. But any of you who've been associated with bureaucracies will know that things are often kept routinely because they might be important one day. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Um, is it true that Queen Victoria had a few exchanges back and forth of letters with Baha'u'llah and actually asked his advice about something? Do you know anything about that? I I haven't, but although I'm old, um, Her Majesty Queen Victoria did predecease me, so I never got an opportunity to ask about this. No, I've really not heard of that, but it's quite possible. I I I, I think if she, if she had, I suspect the Guardian would have told us about it. I mean, there's quite a few things that the Guardian um, clarifies about a 19th century history that we didn't know about, and I've never heard it mentioned that. Okay, thank you. Brenda, you must have heard something. So I guess we take it from Stephen that he hasn't heard anything official. But, um, but, but Brenda, tell me, you know, send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll pretend. Uh, I, it. I heard it mentioned at some talk. I'm sorry, I don't know which one or who gave it. And I thought, gosh, that's the first time I've heard that. 
Mm. So it just popped into my mind. I thought I would ask you to authenticate it. So obviously it wasn't true. Thank you. No, I didn't say it wasn't true. I said I didn't know it. That's well, uh, I think you might know very much. You know? <laughs> you. Um, um, Oakville really? Community has a comment, uh, a question, Moyen. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Is it Peruz? Go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, my question is a question that I have been entertaining in my thoughts for a very long time. <clears throat> and the question is, Baha'u'llah knew that none of these kings and rulers of the world would show a favorable look to these letters. And he knew that as far as that strata of society is concerned, the letters will not be effective. Why do you think he wrote these tablets? You're absolutely right. That 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 is one of the really key questions. And isn't it the whole thing of how God chooses to do things? He doeth as he willeth and sustaineth and ordaineth what he pleaseth. If it you know, he says somewhere, if God wanted to, he could have just uh made everything work just like that but that's not his way he he wants us to work hard to create that transformation um muhammad of course wrote to several uh monarchs he wrote to the um byzantine emperor indeed he told the byzantine emperor that um one day his uh city constantinople would be the center of Islam, uh, and indeed it, it was, or there was another 700 years before it became that. Um, it's, it's also, I, I think I, I put in the title something like messages, both general and specific. So it's, it's a mistake to see these letters purely as letter from Baha'u'llah to this monarch. It's quite clear, particularly if you look at the letters to the Pope, to Napoleon III, to Queen Victoria, that he is going to great lengths to talk in terms of Christian prophecy and show how he fulfills them and how uh, the same people who are perfectly willing to see Jewish prophecy about Christ as having been figurative. He shall come on the clouds and all this stuff. Um, and yet want to see Christ's prophecies about his second coming as literal. And um, so these letters will actually be teaching people to um, rethink their position years from now they, they are not just letters to um this one king and if the king didn't take it on board it's lost you know as i said the letter to the shah just its sheer beauty if if if, if baha'u'llah had been a poet you would rank him with shakespeare or some of the best ai you know he um they are from for humanity as well as for the intended recipient but also it's a question of glory isn't it what did it do what it did it do to the people who were patiently suffering for the faith who had seen baha'u'llah and his main followers incarcerated in the worst prison in the Middle East to realize that Baha'u'llah was writing to all these vainglorious emperors of Europe and to the Shah and the Sultan and telling them what they should be doing. It, it certainly, if I was suffering for the faith, would, would make me feel better about what was happening. 
Very good. Um, Thank you. Uh, Perry, dear, was that a, a, a hand up for a question or was it more of a high five? Yes, okay, go ahead. Thank you. That was a great, great talk. Um, I, I also think maybe that these letters are not only to those people. These are part of the history, and Baha'u'llah wanted the world to have this as a record, right? And it is for everyone and for future people and for them to give a lesson to people to read the history. Like, did you see what Baha'u'llah Baha said? And now this. Yeah, yes, absolutely. That's when you consider we, we are moving into a situation in which the vast majority of people like to laugh at religion to an extent. They they feel wrongly, in my view, that because we've discovered how um species evolved somehow that was god's job and therefore god no longer exists or khrushchev uh when this book what one went up said we have driven god from out of the heavens their conception of god is limited and when their conception limited conception of god is proved to be inaccurate they therefore assume that it's god that's wrong rather than them and it, it if Learned people who are experts on 19th century history look at what the expectation was in 1870 of what would happen in the Franco-Prussian War as opposed to what did happen. And then they look at what Baha'u'llah said to Napoleon III, or indeed what he said to the Pope, or what he said to uh, the Emperor they would find it quite hard. You find it quite hard if you dismiss religion entirely to argue against something, some kind of prior knowledge possessed by Baha'u'llah. So that's why I think it, it it will help. It'll come to its own the more that people try to ridicule religion, which they will increasingly, um, before it gets better. Stephen, all the more reason why we need to know this history, um, because this is a phenomenal event that took place, as I understand it, the, the only example uh, among any of the world's religious systems where um, letters such as this were written to the world's rulers. So um, uh, there was a question earlier just to confirm that we don't have these letters in Baha'i archives. Is that correct? Oh no, we have copies of them. Copies. How 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 else how else do you think um, the tablet uh, summons the Lord of Hosts was written? Mm -hmm. um, Baha'u'llah himself, as you know, was very careful um, about making sure that what went out in his name was what he intended. And it's true that many of the things which are now in the archives building, for instance, and in the uh, Center for the Study of the Text have been handed in by their recipients and you can't expect governments yet to do that. Nevertheless, they would have kept copies of this material when it, when it was sent. And, and they did. Mm -hmm. So yes, all of this really is, is in the center for the study of the text. With the exception of the one that was thrown over the shoulder. Well, I, I don't know, you see, that, that also could, could be in existence. I, I can't really tell you um, the exact details, but a chap um, who was an exile here in, Oxford, who had been in prison 
in a Middle Eastern country, wrote um, his memoirs, uh, not just not about him, but the history of the faith in his country. And uh, I only know about this because I proofread it for him because he, he English was not his first language. <laughs> then he sent it to the House of Justice and the House of Justice said, when it is safe, we will publish this. Now, he has now been dead 20 years and they have not yet judged it safe. And the reason is, is because there were many places, for instance, in that country, which are important to us uh, and will one day be important to, to Baha'is. But it would seem ridiculous to um, tell those people who might want to harm the faith where these places are. And, and and so the, the House of Justice, I think, is quite careful about what it publishes, when it publishes, mm -hmm. not because it's got anything to be ashamed of, but it's a question of protection of the faith. Mm -hmm. So it may be, it may be that there might be something in the first letter, which um, would... I don't know, uh, damage the standing of the faith in France, but I, I you know, I mean, that, that, that's complete speculation. I've no idea. But I, I, just because I don't, I haven't seen a copy of it, does not mean to say that it doesn't exist. The House of Justice knows what it's doing, and I don't. <laughs> that sounds like a good place to end. <laughs> um, uh, friends, I think I, I will, I don't see any further questions. Um, and maybe we can take this opportunity collectively via me to thank Stephen, Dr. Vickers for uh, sharing this wealth of knowledge and, and really just opening up a whole area of uh, uh, curiosity um, for us to further explore. And I hear that there will be a book coming out to help us in that uh, endeavor. So I thank you, uh, Stephen, on behalf of everyone here. I understand that, that it's like 1.30, 1.40 in the morning for you. You're exceptionally coherent at this time. And I don't know your daytime coherence, but I'd say this is a good time for you, actually, to give a talk. <laughs> thank you. I must thank you very much for your hospitality. It's only the second time in my life I've ever been to Oakville. In fact, <laughs> I haven't been to Ontario in reality since 1972. But I have to say to you that I can see my friend Faribar Hedayati from Newcastle on Tyne is also uh, here in the middle of her night. She's just vanished, but um, yeah. so I'm not the only one that's uh, here at a weird time of day. Thank you. Oh, Sorry, not. I will attach my camera. <laughs> I am <laughs> fully awake, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me anyway. It's very yeah. nice of you. And I hope to come to, to some more of your events because I think they're lovely. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording. Uh...